Story number 20 of L. M. Montgomery Short Stories from 1909 through 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elisa McCaslin, May 2011. Lucy Maud Montgomery Short Stories, 1909 through 1922, by Lucy Maud Montgomery. The Letters just before the letter was brought to me that evening, I was watching the red November sunset from the library window. It was a stormy, unrestful sunset, gleaming angrily through the dark fir boughs that were now and again tossed suddenly and distressfully in a fitful gust of wind. Below in the garden it was quite dark, and I could only see dimly the dead leaves that were whirling and dancing uncannily over the roseless paths. The poor dead leaves, yet not quite dead. There was still enough unquiet life left in them to make them restless and forlorn. They hearkened yet to every call of the wind, who cared for them no longer but only played freakishly with them and broke their rest. I felt sorry for the leaves as I watched them in that dull, weird twilight, and angry in a petulant fashion that almost made me laugh with the wind that would not leave them in peace. Why should they, and I, be vexed with these transient breaths of desire for a life that had passed us by? I was in the grip of a bitter loneliness that evening, so bitter and so insistent that I felt I could not face the future at all. Even with such poor fragments of courage as I had gathered about me after father's death, hoping that they would at least suffice for my endurance, if not for my content. But now they fell away from me at sight of the emptiness of life. The emptiness. Ah, it was from that I shrank. I could have faced pain and anxiety and heartbreak undauntedly, but I could not face that terrible, yawning, barren emptiness. I put my hands over my eyes to shut it out, but it pressed in upon my consciousness insistently and would not be ignored longer. The moment when a woman realizes that she has nothing to live for, neither love nor purpose nor duty, holds for her the bitterness of death. She is a brave woman indeed who can look upon such a prospect unquailingly, and I was not brave. I was weak and timid. Had not father often laughed mockingly at me because of it? It was three weeks since father had died. My proud, handsome, unrelenting old father, whom I had loved so intensely, and who had never loved me. I had always accepted this fact unresentfully and unquestioningly, but it had steeped my whole life in its tincture of bitterness. Father had never forgiven me for two things. I had cost my mother's life and I was not a son to perpetuate the old name and carry on the family feud with the Frasers. I was a very lonely child, with no playmates or companions of any sort, and my girlhood was lonelier still. The only passion in my life was my love for my father. I would have done and suffered anything to win his affection in return, but all I ever did win was an amused tolerance, and I was grateful for that, almost content. It was much to have something to love and be permitted to love it. If I had been a beautiful and spirited girl, I think father might have loved me, but I was neither. At first I did not think or care about my lack of beauty. Then one day I was alone in the beech wood. I was trying to disentangle my skirt which had caught on some thorny underbrush. A young man came around the curve of the path and seeing my predicament bent with murmured apology to help me. He had to kneel to do it and I saw a ray of sunshine falling through the beeches above us strike like a lance of light athwart the thick brown hair that pushed out from under his cap. Before I thought, I put out my hand and touched it softly. Then I blushed crimson with shame over what I had done. But he did not know. He never knew. When he had released my dress, he rose, and our eyes met for a moment as I timidly thanked him. I saw that he was good to look upon, tall and straight, with broad, stalwart shoulders and dark, clean-cut face. He had a firm, sensitive mouth and kindly, pleasant, dark blue eyes. I never quite forgot the look in those eyes. It made my heart beat strangely, but it was only for a moment, and the next he had lifted his cap and passed on. As I went homeward, I wondered who he might be. He must be a stranger, I thought, probably a visitor in some of our few neighboring families. I wondered, too, if I should meet him again, and found the thought very pleasant. I knew few men, and they were all old like father, or at least elderly. They were the only people who ever came to our house, and they either teased me or overlooked me. 
none of them was at all like this young man i had met in the beechwood nor ever could have been i thought when i reached home i stopped before the big mirror that hung in the hall and did what i had never done before in my life looked at myself very scrutinizingly and wondered if i had any beauty i could only sorrowfully conclude that i had not i was so slight and pale and the thick black hair and dark eyes that might have been pretty in another woman seemed only to accentuate the lack of spirit and regularity in my features i was still standing there gazing wistfully at my mirrored face with a strange sinking of spirit when father came through the hall his riding whip in his hand seeing me he laughed don't waste your time gazing into mirrors isabel he said carelessly that might have been excusable in former ladies of shirley whose beauty might pardon and even adorn vanity but with you it is only absurd the needle and the cookbook are all that you need concern yourself with i was accustomed to such speeches from him but they had never hurt me so cruelly before at that moment i would have given all the world only to be beautiful the next sunday i looked across the church and in the fraser pew i saw the young man i had met in the wood he was looking at me with his arms folded over his breast and on his brow a little frown that seemed somehow indicative of pain and surprise i felt a miserable sense of disappointment if he were the fraser's guest i could not expect to meet him again father hated the fraser's all the shirleys hated them it was an old feud bitter and lasting that had been as much our inheritance for generations as land and money the only thing father had ever taken pains to teach me was detestation of the Frasers and all their works. I accepted this as I accepted all the other traditions of my race. I thought it did not matter much. The Frasers were not likely to come my way, and hatred was a good satisfying passion in the lack of all else. I think I rather took a pride in hating them, as became my blood. I did not look at the Fraser pew again, but outside under the elms we met him, standing in the dappling light and shadow. He looked very handsome and a little sad. I could not help glancing back over my shoulder as father and I walked to the gate, and I saw him looking after us with that little frown which again made me think something had hurt him. I liked better the smile he had worn in the beechwood, but I had an odd liking for the frown too, and I think I had a foolish longing to go back to him, put up my fingers and smooth it away. "'So Alan Fraser had come home,' said my father. "'Alan Fraser,' I repeated with a strange, horrible feeling of coldness and chill coming over me, like a shadow on a bright day. "'Alan Fraser, the son of old Malcolm Fraser of Glen Allen, the son of our enemy. "'He had been living since childhood with his dead mother's people, so much I knew. "'And this was he?' "'Something stung and smarted in my eyes. "'I think the sting and smart might have turned to tears if father had not been looking down at me.' yes didn't you see him in his father's pew but i forgot you are too demure to be looking at the young men in preaching or out of it isabel you are a model young woman odd that the men never like the model young women curse old malcolm fraser what right has he to have a son like that when i have nothing but a pulling girl remember isabel that if you ever meet that young man you are not to speak to or look at him or even intimate that you are aware of his existence he is your enemy and the enemy of your race. You will show him that you realize this. Of course, that ended it all, though just what there had been to end would have been hard to say. Not long afterwards, I met Alan Fraser again when I was out for a canter on my mare. He was strolling through the beechwood with a couple of big collies, and he stopped short as I drew near. I had to do it. Father had decreed. My Shirley pride demanded that I should do it. I looked him unseenly in the face, struck my mare a blow with my whip, and dashed past him. I even felt angry. I think that a Fraser should have the power to make me feel so badly in doing my duty. After that, I had forgotten. There was nothing to make me remember, for I never met Alan Fraser again. The years slipped by, one by one, so like each other in their colorlessness, that I forgot to take account of them. I only knew that I grew older and that it did not matter, since there was nobody to care. One day they brought father in, white-lipped and groaning. His mare had thrown him, and he was never to walk again, although he lived for five years. Those five years had been the happiest of my life. For the first time I was necessary to someone. There was something for me to do which nobody else could do so well. I was father's nurse and companion, and I found my pleasure in tending him and amusing him, 
soothing his hours of pain and brightening his hours of ease. People said, I did my duty toward him. I had never liked that word duty since the day I had ridden past Alan Fraser in the beechwood. I could not connect it with what I did for father. It was my delight because I loved him. I did not mind the moods and the irritable outbursts that drove others from him. But now he was dead, and I sat in the sullen dusk wishing that I need not go on with life either. The loneliness of the big echoing house weighed on my spirit. I was solitary, without companionship. I looked out on the outside world where the only sign of human habitation visible to my eye was the light twinkling out from the library window of Glen Ellen on the dark fir hills two miles away. By that light I knew Alan Fraser must have returned from his long sojourn abroad, for it only shone when he was at Glen Ellen. He still lived there. Something of a hermit, people said. He had never married, and he cared nothing for society. His companions were books and dogs and horses. He was given to scientific researches and wrote much for the reviews. He traveled a great deal. So much I knew in a vague way. I even saw him occasionally in church, and never thought the years had changed him much, save that his face was sadder and sterner than of old, and his hair had become iron gray. People said that he had inherited and cherished the old hatred of the Shirleys, that he was very bitter against us. I believed it. He had the face of a good hater, or lover, a man who could play with no emotion but must take it in all earnestness and intensity. When it was quite dark, the housekeeper brought in the lights, and handed me a letter, which she said a man had just brought up from the village post office. I looked at it curiously before I opened it, wondering from whom it was. It was postmarked from a city several miles away, and the firm decided rather peculiar handwriting was strange to me. I had no correspondence. After father's death I had received a few perfunctory notes of condolence from distant relatives and family friends. They had hurt me cruelly, for they seemed to excel a subtle spirit of congratulation on my being released from a long and unpleasant martyrdom of attendance on an invalid that quite overrode the decorous phrases of conventional sympathy in which they were expressed. I hated those letters for their implied injustice. I was not thankful for my release. I missed father miserably and longed passionately for the very tasks and vigils that had evoked their pity. This letter did not seem like one of those. I opened it and took out some stiff, blackly written sheets. They were undated, and turning to the last I saw that they were unsigned. With a not unpleasant tingling of interest I sat down by my desk to read. The letter began abruptly. You will not know by whom this is written. Do not seek to know, now or ever. It is only from behind the veil of your ignorance of my identity that I can ever write to you fully and freely as I wish to write, can say what I wish to say in words denied to a formal and conventional expression of sympathy. Dear lady, let me say to you thus what is in my heart. I know what your sorrow is, and I think I know what your loneliness must be, the sorrow of a broken tie, the loneliness of a life thrown emptily back on itself. I know how you loved your father, how you must have loved him if those eyes and brow and mouth speak truth, for they tell of a nature divinely rich and deep, giving of its wealth and tenderness ungrudgingly to those who are so happy as to be of the object of its affection. To such a nature bereavement must bring a depth and an agony of grief unknown to shallower souls. I know what your father's helplessness and need of you meant to you, I know that now life must seem to you a broken and embittered thing, and knowing this I venture to send this greeting across the gulf of strangerhood between us, telling you that my understanding sympathy is fully and freely yours, and bidding you take heart for the future, which now, it may be, looks so heartless and hopeless to you. Believe me, dear lady, it will be neither. Courage will come to you with the kind days you will find noble's tasks to do, beautiful and gracious duties waiting along your path. The pain and suffering of the world never dies, and while it lives there will be work for such as you to do, and in the doing of it you will find comfort and strength and the highest joy of living. I believe in you. I believe you will make of your life a beautiful and worthy thing. I give you God's speed for the years to come. Out of my own loneliness, I, an unknown friend, who has never clasped your hand, send this message to you. 
I understand, I have always understood, and I say to you, be of good cheer. To say that this strange letter was a mystery to me seems an inadequate way of stating the matter. I was completely bewildered, nor could I even guess who the writer might be, think and ponder as I might. The letter itself implied that the writer was a stranger. The handwriting was evidently that of a man, and I knew no man who could or would have sent out such a letter to me. The very mystery stung me to interest. As for the letter itself, it brought me an uplift of hope and inspiration such as I would not have believed possible an hour earlier. It rang so truly and sincerely, and the mere thought that somewhere I had a friend who cared enough to write it, even in such odd fashion, was so sweet that I was half ashamed of the difference it made in my outlook. Sitting there, I took courage and made a compact with myself that I would justify the writer's faith in me that I would take up my life as something to be worthy lived for all good, to the disregard of my own selfish sorrow and shrinking. I would seek for something to do, for interests which would bind me to my fellow creatures, for tasks which would lessen the pains and perils of humankind. An hour before this would not have seemed to me possible. Now it seemed the right and natural thing to do. A week later another letter came. I welcomed it with an eagerness which I feared was almost childish, it was a much longer letter than the first and was written in quite a different strain. There was no apology for or explanation of the motive for writing. It was as if the letter were merely one of a permitted and established correspondence between old friends. It began with a witty, sparkling review of a new book the writer had just read and passed from this to crisp comments on great events, political, scientific, artistic of the day. The whole letter was pungent, interesting, delightful an impersonal essay on a dozen vital topics of life and thought. Only at the end was a personal note struck. Are you interested in these things? ran the last paragraph. In what is being done and suffered and attained in the great busy world? I think you must be, for I've seen you and read what is written in your face. I believe you care for these things as I do, that your being thrills to the still, sad music of humanity, that the songs of the poets I love find an echo in your spirit, and the aspirations of all struggling souls a sympathy in your heart. Believing this, I have written freely to you, taking a keen pleasure in thus revealing my thoughts and visions to one who will understand, for I too am friendless, in the sense of one standing alone, shut out from the sweet, intimate communion of feeling and opinion that may be held with the heart's friends. Shall you have read this as a friend, I wonder, a candid, uncritical, understanding friend? Let me hope it, dear lady. I was expecting the third letter when it came. But not until it did come did I realize what my disappointment would have been if it had not. After that, every week brought me a letter. Soon those letters were the greatest interest in my life. I had given up all attempts to solve the mystery of their coming, and was content to enjoy them for themselves alone. From week to week I looked forward to them with an eagerness that I would hardly confess even to myself. And such letters as they were, growing longer and fuller and freer as time went on, such wise, witty, brilliant, pungent letters, stimulating all my torpid life into tingling zest, I would begun to look abroad in my small world for worthy work and found plenty to do. My unknown friend evidently kept track of my expanding efforts, for he commented and criticized, encouraged and advised freely. There was a humor in his letters that I liked. It leavened them with its sanity and reacted on me most wholesomely, counteracting many of the morbid tendencies and influences of my life. I found myself striving to live up to the writer's ideal of philosophy and ambition, as pictured often unconsciously in his letters. They were an intellectual stimulant as well. To understand them fully, I found it necessary to acquaint myself thoroughly with the literature and art, the science and the politics they touched upon. After every letter, there was something new for me to hunt out and learn and assimilate, until my old narrow mental attitude had so broadened and deepened, sweeping out into circles of thought I had never known or imagined, that I hardly knew myself. They had been coming for a year before I began to reply to them. I had often wished to do so. There were so many things I wanted to say and discuss, but it seemed foolish to write letters that could not be sent. 
One day a letter came that kindled my imagination and stirred my heart and soul so deeply that they insistently demanded answering expression. I sat down at my desk and wrote a full reply to it, safe in the belief that the mysterious friend to whom it was written would never see it. I wrote with a perfect freedom and a total lack of self-consciousness that I could never have attained otherwise. The writing of that letter gave me a pleasure second only to that which the reading of his brought. For the first time I discovered the delight of revealing my thoughts unhindered by the conventions. Also, I understood better why the writer of those letters had written them. Doubtless he had enjoyed doing so and was not impelled thereto simply by a purely philanthropic wish to help me. When my letter was finished, I sealed it up and locked it away in my desk, with a smile at my middle-aged folly. What, I wondered, would all my sedate, serious friends, my associates of mission and hospital committees, think if they knew? Well, everybody has or should have a pet nonsense in their life. I did not think mine was any sillier than some others I knew, and to myself I admitted that it was very sweet. I knew if those letters ceased to come, all savor would go out of my life. After that I wrote a reply to every letter I received, and kept them all locked up together. It was delightful. I wrote out all my doings and perplexities and hopes and plans and wishes, yes, and my dreams. The secret romance of it all made me look on existence with joyous, contented eyes. Gradually a change crept over the letters I received. Without ever affording the slightest clue to the identity of their writer, they grew more intimate and personal. A subtle, caressing note of tenderness breathed from them and thrilled my heart curiously. I felt as if I were being drawn into the writer's life, admitted into the most sacred recesses of his thoughts and feelings. Yet it was all done so subtly, so delicately, that I was unconscious of the change until I discovered it in reading over the older letters and comparing them with the latter ones. Finally a letter came. My first love letter— and surely never was a love letter received under stranger circumstances. It began abruptly as all the letters had begun, plunging into the middle of the writer's strain of thought without any preface. The first words drove the blood to my heart, and then sent it flying hotly all over my face. I love you. I must say it at last. Have you not guessed it before? It has trembled on my pen in every line I have written to you, yet I have never dared to shape it into words before. I know not how I dare now. I only know that I must. What a delight to write it out and know that you will read it. Tonight the mood is on me to tell it to you recklessly and lavishly, never pausing to stint or weigh words. Sweetheart, I love you, love you, love you. Dear, true, faithful woman soul, I love you with all the heart of a man. Ever since I first saw you, I have loved you. I can never come to tell you so in spoken words. I can only love you from afar and tell my love under the guise of impersonal friendship. It matters not to you, but it matters more than all else in life to me. I am glad that I love you, dear. Glad, glad, glad. There was much more, for it was a long letter. When I had read it, I buried my burning face in my hands, trembling with happiness. This strange confession of love meant so much to me. My heart leaped forth to meet it with answering love. What mattered it that we could never meet? That I could not even guess who my lover was? Somewhere in the world was a love that was mine alone, and mine wholly and mine forever. What mattered his name or his station, or the mysterious barrier between us? Spirit leaped to spirit unhindered over the fettering bounds of matter and time. I loved and was beloved. Nothing else mattered. I wrote my answer to his letter. I wrote it fearlessly and unstintedly. Perhaps I could not have written so freely if the letter were to have been read by him as it was. I poured out the riches of my love as fully as he had done. I kept nothing back, and across the gulf between us I vowed a faithful and enduring love in response to his. The next day I went to town on business with my lawyers. Neither of the members of the firm was in when I called, but I was an old client and one of the clerks showed me into the private office to wait. As I sat down my eyes fell on a folded letter lying on the table beside me. With a shock of surprise I recognized the writing. I could not be mistaken. I should have recognized it anywhere. The letter was lying by its envelope, so folded that only the middle third of the page was visible. 
an irresistible impulse swept over me, before I could reflect that I had no business to touch the letter, that perhaps it was unfair to my unknown friend to seek to discover his identity when he wished to hide it, I had turned the letter over and seen the signature. I laid it down again and stood up, dizzy, breathless, unseen. Like a woman in a dream, I walked through the outer office and into the street. I must have walked on for blocks before I became conscious of my surroundings. The name I had seen signed to that letter was Alan Fraser. No doubt the reader has long ago guessed it, has wondered why I had not. The fact remains that I had not. Out of the whole world, Alan Fraser was the last man whom I should have suspected to be the writer of those letters. Alan Fraser, my hereditary enemy, who I had been told cherished the old feud so faithfully and bitterly, and hated our very name. And yet, I now wondered at my long blindness. No one else could have written those letters. No one but him. I read them over one by one when I reached home, and now that I possessed the key, he revealed himself in every line, expression, and thought, and he loved me. I thought of the old feud and hatred. I thought of my pride and traditions. They seemed like the dust and ashes of outworn things, things to be smiled at and cast aside. I took out all the letters I had written, all except the last one, sealed them up in a parcel, and directed it to Alan Fraser. Then, summoning my groom, I bade him ride to Glen Ellen with it. His look of amazement almost made me laugh, but after he was gone I felt dizzy and frightened at my own daring. When the autumn darkness came down, I went to my room and dressed, as the woman dresses who awaits the one man of all the world. I hardly knew what I hoped or expected, but I was all athrill with the nameless, inexplicable happiness. I admit I looked very eagerly into the mirror when I was done, and I thought that the result was not unpleasing. Beauty had never been mine, but a faint reflection of it came over me in the tremulous flush and excitement of the moment. Then the maid came up to tell me that Alan Fraser was in the library. I went down with my cold hands tightly clasped behind me. He was standing by the library table, a tall, broad-shouldered man, with the light striking upward on his dark, sensitive face and iron-gray hair. When he saw me, he came quickly forward. "'So you know, and you're not angry? Your letters told me so much. I have loved you since that day in the beach with Isabel. Isabel.' His eyes were kindling into mine. He held my hands in a close, impetuous clasp. His voice was infinitely caressing as he pronounced my name. I had never heard it since father died. I had never heard it at all so musically and tenderly uttered. My ancestors might have turned in their graves just then, but it mattered not. Living love had driven out dead hatred. Isabel, he went on, there was one letter unanswered, the last. I went to my desk, took out the last letter I had written, and gave it to him in silence. While he read it, I stood in a shadowy corner and watched him, wondering if life could always be as sweet as this. When he had finished, he turned to me and held out his arms. I went to them as a bird to her nest, and with his lips against mine, the old feud was blotted out forever. End of The Letters